Black Swan, The Twelve Lessons of Abandonment Recovery by Susan Anderson. Part 1. Little Girl on the Rock. A little girl and her daddy go into the woods to pick a bouquet of wild flowers. They follow a path all the way to the brook where they are immersed in the richness of the forest. Daddy walks the little girl across a log and onto an island in the water. He lifts her up and sets her atop a giant rock. You stay here, he says, and I'll go pick us some huckleberries for lunch. The little girl clasps her hands. Don't go far, Daddy, she begs. I won't, promises the Daddy. He makes his way back across the log and into the forest as the little girl studies the back of his red shirt to keep track of him. He is momentarily hidden, first behind this tree and then behind that one. Suddenly, there is no sign of red at all. Perched atop the giant rock on the island, the little girl begins calling to her Daddy hoping he is right nearby, only teasing her. Daddy, I'm here, she calls. Daddy, where are you? But after a while, she can't hold back her terror. She screams into the forest with all her might, but the forest is silent. As night falls, the little girl is frozen with fright on the cold, hard rock. She is aware of the slithering sounds of snakes and other woodland animals creeping about. She tries not to move. She doesn't want to alert the creatures to her position high atop the rock. But soon, she succumbs to terror once again. Daddy! 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 She cries into the now pitch-black darkness. Mommy! Daddy! The forest remains distinctly silent, except for the menacing sounds of the animals lurking about. Lying on her side, she is uncomfortable in her soiled clothing. She draws her knees up to her chest to hug them, trying to make herself into a ball to try to get warm. Eyes open, unblinking, she keeps a steady vigil throughout the night, afraid she'll be eaten. Morning eventually arrives, its first rays of light, dim and ghastly. The illumination is hideous. It heightens her awareness of her position atop the rock. The brook rushes by. The surrounding forest is dense and enveloping. The little girl knows she cannot stay on the rock or she will surely die. The snakes will get her or she will starve or freeze or be frightened to death. She knows she must get down, but how? She is way up high and the sides are too steep, way too steep to slide down. She thinks about jumping, but she will get hurt. Maybe daddy will come, she hopes. But the waiting is too torturous to endure any longer. She will just have to take her chances and try to let herself fall off the rock. It is the only thing left to do. But she knows she has to be careful not to break too many bones, especially not her arms and legs. If she survives, she will need them to crawl across the log to get to the forest floor. If she can fall the right way, she tries to reassure herself, she might make it. Finally, she takes a big gulp of air and faces certain pain as she executes her fall. It is a terrible, hard, crushing thud on reaching the ground. She feels herself alive, but is not glad of it, for she cannot move. Her eyes are squeezed shut, her side is aflame with pain. Finally, she finds her voice and whimpers to the lonely forest of silent trees. Help me! Help me! she cries. She attempts to draw her arms around her body and rock herself for comfort. This mobility is only an impulse at first, but soon she is able to free her hands to brush off the pebbles and debris from the abrasions and gashes along her hip and leg. As morning sunlight intensifies, she feels the pain in her side get stronger and sharper but soon she is able to carefully move her limbs. She works at this sensation and finally pushes herself up and, after a wobbly first start, begins to balance herself once again. Next, she begins to manage her way, in spite of searing pain, carefully down the log which spans the gushing brook. As she painfully inches along, she hopes she can find her daddy. If only she can make it to the edge of the forest. She finally arrives at the shore and begins to work her way into the thick forest. She is holding her hip and limping, trying to follow the direction her daddy's red shirt had taken when he disappeared. At times, she sees a flash of red and follows it into the thickets, veering off the path. The patches of red turn out to be illusory. The tip of a bird wing, the blushing petal of a woodland flower. Her heart sinks with disappointment. And then she thinks she sees red again and rushes deeper into the wilderness in pursuit. By now, she has abandoned the network of narrow footpaths and meandered this way. 
and that throughout the dense woods. Hunger pangs seize her stomach, and she stops her frantic search to take stock of her position. She turns around in all directions. Nothing seems familiar. No paths to follow. She calls out in terror. Daddy! Mommy! Where are you? Help me! She spans the next several days, days and bewildered, calling out to her absent parents, trying to find her way through the wilderness. Her world is filled with terror, stomach cramps, and cold. She continues searching, eats huckleberries, and sleeps on top of logs. All she wants is to find her daddy and mommy and go home. Her heart pounds when she thinks she might never find them. She shakes her head to make the thought go away. She can't be lost forever. One morning, the chirping of a bird gently awakens her. Freckles of sunlight sprinkle across her forest bed. Soon, the bird flies off and the little girl clears sleep from her eyes as she watches him disappear into the sky. She is suddenly struck with the realization that she must find her way back to the brook. Then she won't feel so lost, she reasons. She would only have to walk alongside it, first in one direction, and then perhaps the other in order to find the giant rock where Daddy left her. From there, she might be able to find the path that leads back through the woods, up the hill, and to her house at the edge of the forest. She has walked it many times, but always with her mommy or daddy. Now she will have to find her way home alone. It is her only chance. Yes, she must find the island with the rock. It will be a starting point. She remembers that the ground slopes downhill toward the brook. She attempts to follow the subtle downward trend of the forest floor. After a trial, wandering along, she senses a definite slope under her feet, and her heart rushes as she favors it. She moves downward, descending gradually for a long while. And then, the sky brightens ahead. She hears it, the brook. She runs to greet the water's edge, there to walk along it jubilantly. She has found something familiar. The direction she has chosen feels right. After an hour or so, she senses familiar Terran and keeps going, her steps quickening as she sees the log up ahead. There it stands, the giant rock on the island glistening in the sunlight. Her heart pounds in recognition. The path stretches before her, the same path she and her daddy had taken to the brook. Would she have enough time to find her way back home before it gets dark? She tries to main path, her limbs rushing along, but it soon forks in opposite directions, and she can't remember which one to take. She picks the path that goes left, but it soon dwindles down to nothing. She is lost again, but this time she has not lost her sense of the brook. She knows how to follow the forest descent back to the brook, and then back to the original setting. The rock shall be her beginning point to start anew, from which she can find the right combination of paths no matter how many trials it takes. She will find her way home. Toward the end of day, she sees a familiar path in the dusk. It leads her straight up a hill. She recognizes a patch of telescope plants she and her brother and sister used to play with. Anticipation rushes through her test. She sees the bramble bushes, the ones she got stuck on before, and up ahead, the skunk cabbage with its familiar pungent aroma. She rushes to make her way up this familiar hill. Up ahead, she sees the summit with its tall trees that have vines just right for swinging, cascading downward. Seeing her way through these friendly old trees, she greets the final path that leads directly to her house. And there it is, right up ahead, home. She runs toward it, just as darkness falls. She rushes to the front door, ready to throw herself upon it. Daddy! Mommy! She is about to call. But just then, she sees something that makes her heart stop. Her breath is sucked back. It is the big bay window. Through it, she sees the dining room all aglow with candles. There sits her whole family around the table, smiling and laughing. They are all there, her mommy and daddy and brother and sister, everybody together and happy without her. She staggers backward from the sight, the overwhelming truth catching in her chest. 
She has been abandoned. She creeps further back like a wounded animal, removing herself to the edge of the forest. Her heart is frozen in terror, but she does not cry out. She knows the danger is real. There, under cover of enro encroaching darkness, she keeps vigil upon her house. The lugubrious black of the night closes in on her. She gropes for leaves and pine needles in the dark to make a place to lay down. Enveloped in darkness, she listens to the rustling sounds of hungry animals in the woods around her. Her heart pounds and her mind races. She remains with the awful knowledge of her abandonment, her chest hurting until daybreak. When it is light enough, her heart stricken with grief. The little girl returns to the forest edge to watch over her family, attempting to observe its activity under cover of dense forest. There, she sees Mommy and Daddy coming and going, her brother and sister in tow. She remains vigilant all day for signs of them, her pulse quickening and stomach sinking at each sighting. At night, she carefully sneaks bits of food to eat from the garbage left over from her family's meals and takes scraps of paper towels and thrown out things to make her woodland bed more comfortable. She is grateful for any remnants of them. As nights go by, she has acquired many articles of warmth and comfort from her family's garbage. Then, one day, the little girl observes a moving van pull up to her house, and she watches Mommy and Daddy load up all the familiar family possessions. Her brother and sister are gleeful and excited. Finally, Mommy's and Daddy's arms circle around the children, and off they drive in the moving van. Daddy gives the horn a triumphant toot, as they depart. She feels her chest pounding as she watches them disappear up the street, but she does not cry out for them, nor does she abandon her vigil upon the house. She waits minute by minute for their return. A whole week goes by, but the house remains vacant. The waiting is unbearable. Finally, she advances out of her resting place in the forest. She walks up to her house and attempts to enter the front door. It is locked up tight. She circles the house to peer in all of the windows, to witness empty rooms, dust, and discarded debris. She stares into the emptiness of her old bedroom. She vaguely registers the absence of her teddy, her dolls, her bed. Then, after a while, thinking nothing, feeling nothing, she walks away. Not back to the forest, but as far away as she can from all that she has just experienced. Vacantly, she walks across the lawns, up one street, and down the next, and onto the next, and upon and down, through streets she has never walked before. She is barely aware of the traffic getting louder and louder as she wanders through its din. As night falls, she comes to a railroad station, and decides to sleep along the tracks. By early morning, someone has noticed her sleeping among the discarded debris. She is taken to the police station, where they are putting their hands upon her and moving their mouths and making sounds she does not attempt to distinguish. She is taken to a shelter, then to a foster home, followed by another and another, as the weeks and months go by. There is a succession of staring people intruding into her silence with words and faces, but she has learned to find the warmth and comfort of her own urination and defecation in the many beds she is laying. Each night, she keeps vigil upon the doorways and studies the cracks of light long into the nights in all of the various and strange houses that she has been placed in. She doesn't notice the seasons change, or that her hair is growing, or that she herself is growing. And then, one day, she is taken to a residential facility. She barely notices the many children who gape at her as she is taken on tour through the old stone building where she is to live among them. There, as she makes her way down the halls and through the various rooms, still, more people ask her where she's from and what her name is, questions she cannot answer, let alone find the will to speak. Nor, when she has finally left at the residence, does she care to eat with the other children in the dining room. For her, there are no others. No one seems to be really there. No one seems real. When she is hungry, she steals food left over on the children's plates or out of the garbage and takes it to a corner in the kitchen by the garbage cans, there to eat under the counter. Afterward, 
She beds down in the laundry piles. She is always forcibly led back to the dormitory and laid in bed. She does not remain, each night sneaking back to the rags in the laundry again and again, seeking comfort and warmth from her own bodily extractions. Sometimes the other children hit her when she takes their food and call her stupid and other bad names. Sometimes they push her away from them and punch her and tell her she smells. But she does not cry, for she cannot really feel them or hear them. Many more months go by, and finally an event occurs which feels familiar and real. She hears a woman crying, long and deep, from a distance. Soon it fills her ears, awakening her whole body to its tones. Finally, a woman appears in the doorway, wiping her eyes. She approaches the little girl, crouching down and taking her by the hand. Come with me, little one, says the woman, wiping tears from her eyes with the hem of her long flowing skirts. Her voice is gentle. The little girl does not see the woman clearly, for her eyes are not used to focusing. But she follows along the vague identification of softness and allows herself to be taken, letting her hand stay curled inside the woman's. She can smell her warmth and feel the gentleness wrapped around her hand. She thinks of nothing and does not resist as the woman helps her into her winter hat and coat leading her out the big doors onto the large, sprawling lawn where an apple orchard stands in the distance, surrounded by Canadian geese. The woman stands back for a moment and says, I'm going to take you to the water, which is just down that way. She is pointing through the orchard to the sea beyond. The little girl draws back from the woman's hand. Are you afraid of those trees, my darling? Then I won't take you that way. The woman says softly, I will take you the long, open way, around the orchard and through the open meadow instead. And she draws the little girl along gently. I want to introduce you to someone, someone very special, says the woman as they walk along. See, you're doing fine. They slowly make their way to the water. The little girl lets her hand relax and leaves it folded inside the woman's as they walk along. We're almost there, says the woman. See down there? That's where we meet the black swan.